Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Explore More, Bark Less, Navigating Vet Visits. My name is Caitlin Thomas and I am your presenter for today's lecture and Kate Wilson is the co-creator of this lecture series. So we're going to jump right in and start talking about what to do prior to your visit. So before your visit, first thing we want to think about is getting your dog comfortable with the equipment that they might be um, needing to interact with while they're at the vet. So that might be the stethoscope, it might be nail trimmers, maybe having a light in their eyes, um, or maybe having someone look in their ears. These are things that you're, you definitely don't want the dog to be experiencing for the first time when they're in the presence of a new person in a new place um, at a you know, time or location that's not normally typical for these types of things. So sometimes planning ahead can, can really help you kind of get ready for these sorts of things. So this is just a quick little video of a dog, Simon, and her, his guardian, Melinda, who are working here. I'm just getting him comfortable having his ears looked at. So you'll see she just kind of puts the little thing right by his ears. She clicks there to say, good job, and then gives him a treat. So just kind of a, a fun little exercise that you could work on maybe while you watch TV or um, you know, during, maybe a middle of a commercial or something like that. Just kind of a fun little thing that you can start working on with your dog. Another thing we can do is start working on teaching a station or a go to your mat or go to your place. So this is a really useful one because again, we don't want the dog's first time having to get up on a new surface, something like a scale or um, you know, a, a, a higher scale that's up on a table or maybe a lower scale that's on the ground. That slippery surface or, or having to step up onto something and stay there away from their person can be something that if it's their first time experiencing that, it can be pretty uncomfortable and it can sometimes set the stage for what, what could be kind of a rough vet experience versus having this, this fun behavior that the dog already knows or something that's very easy or fun for the dog. So something that I like to do is teach a go to your mat or go to your station. So you, you might take uh, maybe the dog's bed at home and teach it go to your bed or go to your place. Um, you know, every time the dog goes over, we give a bunch of treats for going to their bed or going to their station. Um, we teach them how to stay there and wait and then be released off. And that behavior sometimes can translate perfectly to the vet office. So what we do is we just take that dog, we take the mat that they've been practicing hundreds of times on, we bring it to the vet office, we put it right on top of the scale, and we just say, go to your bed. The dog, hopefully by then, has learned to practice in high distracting environments like the vet office, or um, maybe they practice in a pet store or something similar. So they just pop right up, and then we get our weight there. Another thing we can do is, if your dog likes being held, I really like you know, kind of a, especially for those dogs that um, are more comfortable in our arms or, or even if you're sitting and they can kind of sit on your lap to get your weight where the dog is with you and then the dog comes off, you weigh yourself and then subtract that weight off. So sometimes that can be a, a um, significantly easier experience for the dog rather than just having the dog sit on the scale by themselves. Um, in terms of the mats and things that I like to use, I really like using something like a yoga mat or something um, that has a non-slip surface so that the dog can not be sliding around. Even something like a towel sometimes, if we put like a towel on the scale, when they get up and it starts to slide around a little bit, they get uncomfortable, you know, having the kind of the floor move from under their feet, it feels like. And so that can be pretty aversive. So um, having something like this already set up is a really useful tool. Muzzle training. Um, something that I think that is really often overlooked is preparing dogs for vet visits by teaching the muzzle. So I will always say, and we introduce this in puppy class even, getting your dog comfortable with the muzzle does not mean that your dog is going to be aggressive. All dogs, especially when they're uncomfortable, or all animals I should say, when they're in a state of fight or flight or they're, they're um, injured or there's something going on for them that they don't quite understand what's happening with their body, you can often see some of that, that self-protective behavior, some of that defensive um, maybe snapping or growling when it wouldn't or it might not be there without that same peer, fear or pain response. So something, you know, I, I will say we had a dog that we trained 
uh, geez, maybe three years ago now. And that dog had already prepared for wearing the muzzle, even though this dog was wonderfully social with dogs and people and every animal that he ever met. And they did it actually for fun. Well, that dog ended up breaking his leg and then they ended up using the muzzle there just to make sure that the vet, you know, the vet was going to put it on. And they said, hold on a second, we have a muzzle we've been training with, even though the dog didn't necessarily quote, need it at the time, preparing for that helped that exposure where that dog was injured to be able to be significantly less stressful because the dog was already comfortable with the gear that it was gonna have to wear in that time. So you really never know when this might be useful. So just getting your dog comfortable regardless of where they're at in terms of um, you know, what they're training for is really great. So here's a little video of a dog named Rocky and his guardian working on getting him ready to take a Bordetella so the, the dog is, it's actually a little bit of, um, it's a little syringe that they're working with and he's gonna put his nose through the muzzle. He's just tried a different behavior there. She's gonna put it up and then he's supposed to hit it with his nose. So what that is, is that little syringe at some point when they go to the vet is gonna contain a liquid that is going to need to go into his nose. So what they're working on is they're working on getting him comfortable with in your muzzle, put your head up, you're gonna push into this and eventually we start training with just tiny little droplets of water. You would think that as soon as we add the water, the dog would back away, but when we get enough repetitions and we get enough of a, a really good emotional response for this, they end up doing really well. So that's just a nice little, um, nice little video of a dog having fun training with um, his guardian there. Preparing for paw inspection. This one is really fun too. So we think of what, um, you know, what's most likely to happen with our dogs or why are they most likely to kind of have to head into the vet? Oftentimes dogs do things like crack toenails or they injure their paws or they have some leg pain or they start limping and the vet needs to examine their paws or their legs. And again, we think of how often, you know, outside of the times where we're just kind of um, leisurely petting our dogs or or playing with our dogs and we're kind of petting them down their body, how often are we really working on getting them comfortable with kind of those odd movements, those odd intentional movements? And so what this does is gets them ready just to have their, their paws inspected. This is here on the right, Melinda with her wonderful dog, Simon, and they're just practicing, give me your paw, and then we do a little bit of manipulation and then she's gonna give him a treat. And over time, he gets better and better where they just add a little bit more intensity on as they go. On the left here, you'll see this little puppy Kramer. He's working on putting his paw onto the little towel. So he's got some aversion or discomfort having his paws wiped off. So what they're working on is they're just working on you put your paw onto the towel, offer it for me. I'm gonna rub a teeny tiny bit, move it out from under you. Your only job is just to keep it right there. And then I'm gonna give you a treat. So just a really fun way to kind of get him ready. And you can see he's getting really excited. Um, get him ready for what might happen in the future. So here they're using it for wiping his paws off, but they're going to build that up to the point where they could use it for something like maybe a leg extension. So extend your leg out and then pull your leg back. And we're just getting some cooperation here from the dog. Another thing here is stopping into your vet for happy vet visits. So this one again is one that we don't really, um, you know, we don't really want to overlook. So bringing your dog in just for a happy visit where nothing hap nothing bad happens. You know, if the vet office, if the only time we go is when we are going to have something happen that might be a little bit painful or a little bit scary, or they're going to be need to be examined by a new person, it can be much harder for those dogs than the dogs who say every, you know, it's their favorite place in the world. They always stop by, they get yummy little snacks and then they go home or fun things happen and then they go home. Those dogs are kind of building up a bank so that as we withdraw from the bank, we're not withdrawing from neutral, we're withdrawing from really positive. So we want those exposures at the vet office to be so overwhelmingly positive that when we do need to pop in or we need to stop by, we can always just say, this one time is the one time where things are, um, you know, you're gonna get a little pokey today, but nine out of 10 times, not, none of that happens. So this is just a little video of Laszlo, who is just the sweetest little guy working on his training inside the vet office. So 
this is just a happy vet visit that he's doing here, just stopping by, he's working on a little bit of training and then they're gonna head home. Gathering your favorite items. So again, I never, um, I'll start building up kind of some of my dog's favorite things just as I buy them. So as I buy some, you know, little Himalayan shoes or as I buy some new treats or a special toy, if I have a vet visit coming up, I'm sort of putting those all into a paper bag, just prepping, just prepping that dog for when we're going to have to go. So here I have one of my dog's favorite big stuffed balls that he doesn't really get very often. Um, I have a squeaky ball, which is his favorite in the whole world. We've got a nice giant bag of cut up um, hot dogs and dog treats in there. We have our little cow hooves, which he loves, our little no hide shoes. And then we have his muzzle, which is one of his favorite things as well, and his harness. So I'm just kind of gathering some of the things that he really enjoys just to be able to have kind of stock of them with me. So I always think, I always try to bring more than I need. And in order to keep my hands and kind of my, my sanity intact, I will put these things in a backpack. So I'll just put them in the backpack for when I go to the vet so that I'm not juggling a leash and then a thousand things in my hands and trying to juggle through things because it helps keep my frustration low, which then helps me be more present for my dog. Avoiding stressful events prior to is another really important one. So we'll try to avoid exposure to triggers. I want to make sure that when my dog goes, I have sort of a, um, a full cup, if you will, so the dog isn't kind of coming to the situation with their cup already half empty where they've had a bunch of stressful things happen that day. So I'm going to make sure that maybe I put a sign on the door that day and day before that says, please no knocking, no doorbell, leave packages outside. I'm going to avoid any really busy visits or outings. That's not going to be the day that I take my dog to go training, working around their triggers. I'm not going to take them for walks in the neighborhood. Just, I want to make sure that we kind of have a clean slate, that that dog has done as much de-stressing as possible before we pop into that vet visit, just so that they're kind of coming with their, um, you know, being their best selves and they're not as um, uncomfortable or trigger stacked as they might be had we exposed them to some of their stressful triggers. I will also, this one is really good, um, especially for dogs that have a hard time having people really close to their face. We think of the things that might be um, threatening or aversive to dogs in terms of the vet office and having someone bend over the dog, touch them, maybe pull up their lips and give full eye contact looking into their mouth, that can be pretty scary for a lot of dogs. So something that I'll do is just while my dog is sitting there, while they're, you know, while I'm watching TV, this is a picture of my dog Blue here on the left, I will just take a photo and I'll try to get photos of all angles so that my veterinarian can see all angles of that dog's mouth inside the mouth. I try to get the gums as much as I can, but I'm not forcing it here. I'm just taking natural pictures as they come. Over here on the right, you can see a dog who has a broken tooth there. And this dog does not really love being handled by new people. And so what they did was they just took a picture of it by pulling up the lip. Um, which is kind of my, my absolutely, if needed, we'll do that. Most of the time you can capture it here where you can see the, the open mouth. But for them, they had to get that angle and the dog's jaw was kind of hung down a little bit lower and didn't allow for that. So pulled it right up and then you can see that little chipped tooth. And then they also got pictures of the mouth on both sides so that the veterinarian, when they go, knows exactly what's happening. They made their appointment same day. So she can see exactly what's going on without needing to necessarily get really invasive into that dog's space. I'll also take photos of their ears. I try to get this as close to the vet visit as I can because the veterinarian often wants to see the most up-to-date photo as possible. So I'll grab a photo of both ears inside the ears. I will try to get it as crispy and clear as I possibly can so that they can zoom in and zoom out as needed. And then I'll go ahead and get videos of walking or areas of concerns, any injuries that they might have. So if I'm coming in and I wanna to talk to my veterinarian about how my senior dog is starting to have a little bit of a limp in his gait, I wanna get the best video that I can. So maybe as I'm walking down the street or I'm walking in the house or the yard, I just have someone else or myself take a little clip of that so that the veterinarian can see it as is. Oftentimes too, when you take the dog to the vet and the vet can't quite see exactly what you're seeing at home, this really helps to kind of get 
them a realistic video and picture of exactly what you're trying to communicate. So sometimes seeing it organically in the environment where it's happening is much better and um, accurate than it is trying to have them sort of recreate it in the office. Um, we all know the, the um, you know, you take your car to the mechanic and it stops making the noise that you brought it in for kind of thing. And so this really helps to, um, to kind of get a, a realistic view of what's going on for them. Communicate with your team. So this is really important. Um, I really like to know what's standard in an appointment. So just calling the front desk or, or going in and saying, what is your appointment? What's your typical appointment usually look like? So I come in the door, we're gonna check in. What types of things is my dog going to need is the first thing I wanna find out. So I wanna find out what exactly does my dog need when we come in? Are we going to be doing um, vaccinations? If so, how many? Are we going to need to do a physical exam? If so, what does it look like? Um, but I try to get as much information as possible just so that I can prepare. And I try to keep in mind that the, the vet team really wants what's best for you and your dog, but oftentimes they're very busy and they're just sort of going, you know, they don't know what dogs need what care or they don't know what, what you might prefer as a client. And so I just like to kind of, Again, just communicate as best as I can. I'll try to get a letter or a note or a plan from either myself or, um, or a trainer, depending on what that looks like, just to communicate with them to say, hey, here's our plan. This is what would be most helpful for us. It's not always possible, um, but if so, we're happy to skip whatever is not necessary, that kind of thing, but really just coming up with a plan and discussing that ahead of time so that everyone is prepared when you come in and we reduce stress as much as possible. Options to consider. So things as you're talking to your veterinary team, things to consider. So this is a dog wolf that we are working with currently who is very scared of going into the vet. So one of the things that they do for her over at her vet office is outdoor vet visits. So this is something for her, for this dog, she's scared of new people and she's very scared of going into the office. So for her, one way that we reduce a lot of her stress is she did her happy vet visits, she met her techs that way, she met the te technicians that were gonna be working with her, and she met her veterinarian over here, Dr. S, who's doing a wonderful job on her care. And what, what doing the outside vet visits does is give her, gave her an opportunity to explore. This is specifically helpful for dogs who are fearful of sounds or new places. Sometimes the office can be a little bit overwhelming, but staying outside can really help them feel more comfortable. I have many times had veterinarians do vet visits in the car with my dog. So the dog stays in the car um, and they kind of pop in and it's a, it's a safer, more comfortable way, especially for those dogs with extreme fear. And this can sometimes help speed up the process for the vet team. So the more comfortable the dog is and the more organic the um, the setup is, then the more, you know, more likely it is that they're going to get the information they need and they're going to be able to see what they need to see and do what they need to do. And so sometimes these outdoor visits can really speed up the process. So that's always something that they really, that your team really appreciates. Medication to reduce anxiety. So there is medication that can help reduce anxiety for dogs that are fearful of the vet office um, or certain situations. So there are both situational medications and daily medications that are available. These medications can help lower stress leading up to and help keep stress low throughout. So it's something that if you do talk to your veterinarian, you know, your veterinarian or your vet team and you say, is there anything that I could give my dog prior to the visit? Sometimes these medications are even anywhere from, you know, one to $3 a pill um, or even less. Um, some of them, depending on um, if, if it's on a daily, can sometimes even be like 50 cents a day. So just talking to your vet team and just talking to them about what, their, what your options might be and what the associated costs might be. Are, is a really helpful way to be able to get your dog to be most comfortable. And if your veterinarian isn't sure or doesn't really feel comfortable with that, there are resources available for them specifically, both through in, in Michigan, it's Michigan State University and OBRS are kind of the two places where our veterinary board certified veterinary behaviorists lie. And they're always ha happy to reach out to veterinarians or have veterinarians reach out to them to help talk about what medications might be appropriate as that is their specialty. 
You can also discuss full sedation for scary procedures or for really long procedures. This is especially helpful for dogs who need a lot of things done or for dogs who don't tolerate handling very well. So this is a little um, kind of a little snapshot of my dog Denver who needed to have some x-rays and he's very uncomfortable with a lot of the things that go along with this. He also happens to be, which kind of goes along with his fear of handling, he also happens to not really love having his nails trimmed. He doesn't really love having his ears cleaned. And as we work on those things and we get him more comfortable through training and counter conditioning, this was a really great way to make sure that he had as comfortable of an experience as possible when we needed to do multiple things for him. So I actually brought his bed into the room we laid his bed out. Here he is falling asleep. He gets to lay right next to me. We've got the other dog in the room who is his little buddy. We put him actually on, you know, so he stayed right on the bed as he fell asleep. Then we take his bed, we put it on the gurney, we carried that into the x-ray room, and then here he is laying on the bed in the room. So really very, very comfortable process for him. He just fell asleep and then he woke back up in the same location and had no idea what had gone on. So there we got our vaccinations in, we got our x-rays in, ultrasounds if needed, we can do nail trims, ear cleaning, some grooming procedures you could have done this way, give a bath if we really need to, get the dog wiped off. So this is really something, um, the cost associated here is a little bit higher. And so it's something that you should talk to your veterinary team and see, is this appropriate for my dog? Um, but it's a, it's a really great way to keep stress as low as we possibly can during some of those big things. And it also reduces the risk of a bite, which is not comfortable for the dog or for the team that is around or for us who has to experience our dog being in distress. Desire and flexibility for brief positive visits. So this is something, again, not all dogs are the same. So some dogs really love the vet. It isn't always when we go in, um, you know, it's not always first thing on the team's mind to get you in and out as fast as possible. They really need to know what your specific dog needs. A lot of dogs love the vet and they can tolerate things like a little bit longer of a wait or maybe um, people coming in and out of the room multiple times. And so if your dog is not comfortable with those things or you have a desire to keep your short, your visits as brief as possible, just communicate that with them. Um, maybe even a reminder when they walk in of just want to remind you that we want to make today as fast as possible and as brief as possible um, because we want to get out of here and make sure that my dog has a good experience. I will then just, you know, normally talk to them in my pre-plan ahead of time about doing our necessary procedures first. What has to get done and what can wait? So say the dog needs to have a rabies vaccine and they also need to have a physical exam or they need to have their ears looked at or their eyes looked at can we do the rabies vaccine first so that if my dog is kind of at their limit, we can just skip the rest of those things? Or does my dog have to have their nails trimmed today? Or does my dog have to have maybe their temperature taken? And just talking about kind of the, the different things that your dog might need or not need, just to work together to make things as, as less stressful, least stressful as possible. Sometimes this means that it requires that you be a little bit flexible on the guardian end and schedule a time that is a little bit lighter for them in terms of how busy they are. So sometimes scheduling maybe a Tuesday morning appointment might be much easier on both you and your dog and the vet team to be able to make that visit as easy and slow as possible than if you scheduled maybe a Friday at 6 p.m. or a Saturday morning. So just working together to kind of make sure that your dog is getting what they need and then also breaking procedures into multiple visits. So asking them, can we break this into multiple visits? Can I bring the dog back for the physical exam or can I dog bring the dog back for, um, you know, split the vaccinations in, in half or can we combine them to get one vaccination instead of five different needles um, and really just talking to your vet about what your options are. Arriving. So when you arrive, look at this cute little guy blaze. Um, so once you arrive to your vet office, parking. So something that I find really important is just trying to find a parking space that's away from other dogs and people. So the worst, you know, kind of the, the worst case scenario in my book is you pull up, the dog sees a bunch of people and dogs rushing out the front door, going into the front door, and they're already reacting before they even get into the building. So I want to make sure that when I show up that 
I park in a place that is as quiet and secluded as possible. So maybe a place like this where we're at a specialty office and we can park kind of far away. I'm going to park my car behind a little, um, you know, behind some bushes or behind this little area here. We went very, very conveniently. There is a, a nice little shaded area I could park here. So I'll try to park away from the main doors. I will try, sometimes there are, there's staff parking um, and, and it's normally unmarked, but it's just as far away as I can possibly get and I'll try to park over there. But my main priority is just parking away from um, the high traffic areas. If your dog is in a crate or traveling in a crate, I will cover it so that they're not seeing all of those triggers passing. And then I just face my car away from the walking areas. So here in, in that case, my car would be turned um, you know, parking in instead of backing into this spot, just so that I can make sure that the head of the car where the dog is more likely to look out those windows side to side or out that front window is parking is, is parked away from those main areas. Checking in. So once I arrive there, so you arrive, you've got your parking spot all figured out, you know exactly where you're going. What now? So when I go to check in, you never know what you're going to get in the lobby. It might be very busy, it might be completely empty, and I just have not found out a good way to figure out which is which, you never really know. So I will leave the dog in the car. If it's too hot or too cold outside, I will leave it running for them and bring the key with me and lock the door. But I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna check in without the dog. And this is again, all pre-planned. So my veterinarian already has my plan ahead of time. So we've already created a little pre-plan. We show up. I'm gonna go check in. If I have another person with me, I'm gonna have that person stay with the dog. I show up and say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm here to check in for X dog. We're, we're hoping to leave him in the car until a room becomes available. Could you let us know as soon as one is open? If someone's in the car with the dog, I might just stay and wait for that room to open. If I'm by myself, I might go back out and spend some time with the dog and just ask, can you give me a phone call or I'll come back in and check in in five minutes. Um, but really, I will try my very best to make sure that that time, so the dog is spending in the building, is not as, um, is, is as short as it can possibly be. I will also ask them if there's a room, maybe uh, an exam room by a back door or a side door that happens to be available so that I can get my dog in and out without having to walk through a busy lobby. So I'll ask, is there a back door or is there a place that I could, that I could bring my dog in so that it's lower stress for them? And then the second I get my dog out of the car, I'm gonna feed all the way in. So I'm bringing my food with me and I'm feeding that dog every step of the way just to make that experience as positive as possible. If my dog is not taking food and is really worried, I might then talk to them about maybe staying outside and doing my vet visit outside, or I might just bring them in as fast as possible. Preparing the room ahead. So before we even bring our dog in, once the exam room becomes available, I will bring all those goodies that I prepared for my dog. I'll bring them into the room and I create as much of a calm, happy environment as I possibly can. So I might bring, so you saw in the last picture, my dog Denver, we brought his bed with him. That is his comfort item. It is the best thing for him. He loves it. He, that's, that's his safe zone. So I bring that with him. It is a little bit of a pain, but it's got such a big payoff attached to it that it's no big deal for me. So I have him ride it. I ride, have him ride with it in the car. He gets in. I bring it all the way into the building for him. When then we bring all his really yummy treats and all those special things into the building so that he can go ahead and kind of snack as soon as he gets in. I might toss food all around the room so that the second he walks in the room, it's like a big Easter egg hunt. You know, he's just looking from item to item and thing to thing, and there's so many fun things happening. The second he walks in that room, those things are already set up. So then I'm going to have him stay busy while we're waiting. So one of the things that is common for dogs that are really stressed or anxious is panting. And sometimes that can lead to a little bit of a dry mouth and they need more water than they would otherwise. And so I will have make sure that I have water out. I just bring a little bowl and have that prepped. Here he is on his little bed with his favorite toy. I'll sit on the ground with him. I try my best to be as present as possible and to have my phone kind of put away so that I can focus as much as I need to on him. If they'll play, I'll play a little bit. I might play music or a podcast that they're used to listening to or having on in the background just to help reduce some of those sounds of tags coming down the hallway or people talking if that makes my dog uncomfortable or nails clicking on the ground. Sometimes that can 
cause dogs to react. And so I want to make sure that I'm muffling that as much as possible. And I'm going to then introduce those items as, um, as I need to. So I might give him a couple toys, which are his favorite items, some of his favorite items. And then as soon as he gets kind of sick of those, I might introduce some other things. But really, I want to keep those things rotating so that my dog continues to have a good time. So here you'll see them just sorry for this whiplash video you're going to see here. There's all the items sitting on the ground. They've not been given to all of them yet. Here's this happy little guy. I try to play as much as possible. Just make sure that they're having a great time. You can see which of these dogs is anxious and which is not. I just have a little note here because this little guy here, he saw his favorite vet come in. Um, I do not have him on a leash here. I would say if your dog is uncomfortable with your vet staff or your dog has a history of aggressive behavior towards new people, do not take them off leash and do not let them access the new person. Make sure that that person gets in the room, that we make sure we do a slow introduction or, or no introduction depending on the dog and the situation. But that's just my little caution here. Once you get home. So once you get home, it is not over yet. So you wanna let your dog de-stress as much as possible. Try to remember that after a scary situation, that stress is still in our system. So our cortisol levels are still higher after a stressful event. Once we leave that stressful event, it doesn't mean that, our, um, that the stress is just gone. So I wanna make sure that I'm doing that same thing leading up where I'm making sure that dog is um, as relaxed and has as much of a stress-free time as possible. I wanna do that same thing after that I do before. So I'm gonna avoid high stress activities. I'm gonna make sure that that dog stays as calm and happy as possible. I might do something like after we leave the vet office, I might go and do a nature walk or a hike somewhere where that dog has no triggers around and we can just let the dog explore and sniff and kind of get it out of their system. And I'm gonna choose activities or locations that put very little demand on the dog. Asking the dog to go through a vet visit, no matter how well we design it, can be really stressful for us and really stressful for them. And I wanna make sure, because that, that can be so demanding on them, I wanna make sure that the activities I do after are really just for them and make them as happy and as comfortable as possible. Working with your vet team. So when you are working with your vet team, sorry, that one's a little out of order. Um, here we can see this little guy in his muzzle. She's calling him back over and feeding him. So something scary just happened there for the vet and the dog. And so he, she had to do something there that made him a little bit uncomfortable. So here's the owner just helping support the team a little bit and make sure that we're feeding after that and calling him away and making sure we're just all working together there. So she had to look real quick. Owner calls the dog back, go ahead and feed. Good job, buddy. Kind of helps reassure that dog and make sure that dog is comfortable. Checkout. So during checkout. So I will bring my dog to the car right after checkout. If we are away from those, uh, those, those doors, those main doors, it's really nice if we have sort of a side door here that we can use. I will have, if you've got two people with you and you have the luxury of having a second person who can help you, you know, check and make sure the hallways are clear and check and make sure everything's set up. One person takes the dog to the car, the second person checks the dog out. If needed, and if it's one person, then I will have one person, you bring the dog to the car, same person come back in and then you check out. I'll give the dog in the car because that was a little bit stressful getting through that. I will give them a new treat or a new toy once we get there. I will make sure that I have water available. Sometimes dogs when they're in the room are so stressed they can't eat or drink. And I wanna make sure that when they get out of that situation, they can kind of rehydrate as necessary and drink as much as they need to after they get out. So I will have a bowl of water in the car available. I will then go back in and I will pay. And if I can, I'll leave my credit card on file for the future so that as I'm leaving, you can just say, my credit card's on file, please shoot me you know, my invoice or, or let me know what the bill was or whatever. But you can just have them automatically pull that out of your account so that you're not having to stay behind and kind of hold up both their line and also your, you know, not spending time with your dog when they're stressed. And thank you for attending, making sure that we're working cooperatively or, or helping people work cooperatively with the other um, 
people that are there to help care for our dogs is really important to us as an organization and as a team. And we just hope that you find this helpful and useful and that you and your veterinary team can work together as best as possible to help every dog um, you know, in your home or every cat, every animal in your life. And we hope to see you next time. Have a great evening, everyone. Yes, yeah. good job. Hip. Yes, yes. Very good. He looks totally relaxed. Push. I love that. That's fantastic. Yes. Very Hi. good. That's what we've been working on.